Good afternoon. I'm Serena Collado, Director of Community Health at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Somerset. Welcome to today's webinar on the strain of COVID, take your shot at a vaccine, presented in collaboration with Friends Health Connection. Like all viruses, the COVID-19 virus is constantly mutating. Many different variants have been identified throughout the world. During today's webinar, we will discuss the most widespread variants, how they affect the transmission and treatment of the virus, and how effective the vaccines are against these strains. We are pleased to joined, uh, be joined today by Dr. Ron Nahas, an infectious disease specialist who is the hospital epidemiologist for Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Somerset. Before we begin our webinar, I would like to ask Tony Kava, our president and CEO of Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Somerset, to share a hospital update on COVID-19. Tony? Good morning, Serena. Uh, good morning, Dr. Nahas. Thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. We're really excited about this. Uh, I'm sure that you'll learn a lot from Dr. Nahas' presentation. Um, I guess my job this morning or, or early this afternoon is really to kind of give you an overview of, of the last year. I mean, as most of you know, this is uh, essentially our one year anniversary, although I hate to call it an anniversary, but that's essentially what it is in terms of when both the state of New Jersey and our hospital saw our first COVID positive patient. Um, to give you a snapshot of, of where we've been, uh, as you know, uh, we have gone through two waves of this pandemic. The first wave uh, came in full force in uh, early March, uh, and we saw a peak in April and then started to see a decrease through May and June. Uh, at one point at our hospital in the, during the first wave, we had uh, about 176 COVID positive patients, uh, which was, they were cared for in four of our medical surgical units and our intensive care unit. Uh, we actually, during the first wave, increased our critical care capacity uh, from 16 beds to 38 beds, and at one point had all those 38 beds filled. Um, it, it was a really trying time for all of us. Um, part of the issue was we were kind of feeling our way in the dark the first time around. We uh, didn't have defined treatments uh, against COVID. Uh, we were all experiencing something uh, collectively for the very first time. As we uh, came in the summertime, you all know that we had a little bit of a let up. Uh, we saw the COVID numbers go down because of the warm weather, people going outside. And then we saw a resurgence and our second wave began in uh, mid-October. The difference I believe between the first and second wave um, or a couple of things. One, it was more of an extended process. We didn't hit that dramatic peak and then come down. We, we saw a peak, but not to the level of the first time around, but we saw an extended period where we were dealing with COVID positive patients. Continuing through uh, now, where we're starting to see a, a, a decrease in, in the overall uh, positivity and the number of patients coming into our facility. I think the other thing is we, we were better equipped. We, we definitely knew how to treat these patients more efficiently. Uh, we had better drugs at our disposal. We had the use of monoclonal antibodies, which we didn't have in the first wave, which allowed us to, to give that in our emergency department as an outpatient and discharge patients. We did that over 300 times during the second wave. Uh, so we didn't overtax our facilities. We didn't overtax um, our inpatient beds or our ICU capacity. So we, we definitely got better at, at treating and handling these patients. Um, the length of stay uh, decreased dramatically from the second wave to the first wave. So all those factors put together allowed us to, uh, to really be much more efficient in terms of our way of, uh, of handling and treating patients. And then of course we come to uh, where we are now with, with vaccines. And, I, and I'm sure Dr. Nahouse will talk a lot about that. We now have three vaccines that, are, that have been approved. We have the Pfizer and Moderna products, which everyone know are two doses. And now we have the Johnson & Johnson product, uh, which is one dose. All are, are efficacious, all are safe um, and, and at our disposal now. And hopefully we'll begin to really see widespread dissemination of the vaccine. And once the availability increases and it's available everywhere, we hope to see more and more of our, uh, our patients, more and more of the community uh, avail themselves of, of the vaccine. Uh, one final thought for me is um, our, our black and our brown community were hit especially hard with COVID uh, during the first and the second wave. And part of our push was to really get out to those communities and educate. 
But as part of the availability or, uh, of the vaccine, we are also moving in that direction and are really going to be uh, meeting and talking with our vulnerable populations to get the vaccine into their arms as well so that we can decrease um, decrease the severity of disease within in the black and brown population. So I'm really pleased to be able to turn this over to Dr. Nehas. I, I have to say personally and professionally, he's helped me, he's helped our organization. He, he's really been a, a guiding light in a lot of respects for us and keeping us at a forefront of our ability to treat and, and manage COVID patients. So I, I think you'll enjoy his presentation as I've enjoyed uh, working with him over this past year. So uh, Dr. Nehas, thank you for what you're gonna do today. Serena, I'll kick it back to you. Thank you so much, Tony, appreciate that. So um, for our webinar today, we're going to start our program with about 40 minutes of a moderated discussion, followed by questions from our audience. So Dr. Nehas, thank you again for joining us. Um, why don't we begin by giving our audience some background about how viruses work and how they mutate. Thanks, Maria, and my pleasure to be here and uh, uh, hopefully uh, get folks up to speed on variants and vaccines. But you know, this whole issue around variants and uh, why they're occurring is really part of the, what we would call the natural selection or the natural life cycle of a virus. Um, all things evolve, all living things evolve, and they evolve to allow them to survive better. And as we've heard in the news over the last several months, these variants have had concerns raised about their ability to either be transmitted or their ability to cause more severe disease and the ability to uh, avoid our own what's called immune surveillance. That means our body's ability to fight the virus. If you think of it as the virus having a goal in life, the goal in life is to survive. And if our body is fighting that virus, the virus is gonna think about a way that it can change or mutate to allow it to survive, to go on and infect another person. And that happens naturally in all spheres of life. So we see that with bacteria, we see that with viruses, but we also see that even within humans. And so, you know, if you look at uh, this human species, our lifespan has expanded over many, many, many millennia um, to again, allow us to survive longer and to allow us to survive more healthily. So, the, the, the ability of a virus to mutate, the ability of the virus to develop variants is a normal biologic process that we would have expected. We have seen that with other viruses and it's not a surprise that we're seeing it with this virus as well. So thank, thank you for um, that explanation. We appreciate that. So presently, how many COVID-19 variants are there? You really don't want me to answer that question, do you, Dorita? <laughs> Uh, at, at the moment, the number and, you know, in the news, how many do you hear or how many are there? I mean, there's two different questions there. And uh, some of you that may have heard me speak before, you know, heard me talk about this. Right now, there's over 4,000 variants that have been identified in the COVID virus. Um, so that sounds pretty like a pretty striking number. But the variants and the variants or strains, if you will, of the virus have been talked about actually throughout the pandemic. And we first noticed the change in the variants back actually in the first wave. And, and, and in that period of time, there was a predominant strain that was circulating in Asia. Um, that actually changed pretty quickly when it went over to Italy and then came to the US. We didn't hear much about it at that time, one, because it wasn't widely recognized, two, as, uh, as Mr. Kava pointed out early in the epidemic, this was all brand new to us and we had lots of other things to worry about. But the variants in the virus began back in the first wave. They've continued now. There are over 4,000. But at the moment, um, there are only a few that sort of have the public's eye or the news media's fancy and uh, that are got different names that allow us to understand them. But, uh, you know, we've heard them as country of origins. That's not always politically correct, but it's easier to understand it in that way. So we have the, the UK variant the South African variant and the, and the South American, if you will, variant that have really caught the public's fancy. More recently, in the past week, we now have recognized that there appears to be a variant that's actually ticking up in the New York, New Jersey area. I'll call that the New York variant, although it, uh, you know, it has a technical name um, as well. And there may even be a variant circulating in New Jersey that's being recognized over the last month or so that has its own name. So. So there are a lot of variants around. 
Um, the fact that the news media or the scientists are talking about a few of them is only part of the story. So Dr. Nehaus, you mentioned a number of them. Are those the ones that are most common that have been identified or, and are, are most prevalent in the United States or are there others that are more prevalent? Right. So it's important to understand that, and so that's a great question. The, the one that is currently most prevalent in the United States is the actual original, the original variant, the variant that had been the so-called wild type that had been circulating here through the you know, late fall, early winter, and now sort of late winter. Um, that's declining in prevalence. The one that's increasing most that we're seeing is the so-called UK variant, or the technical term is the B117 variant. That one is assuming greater um, importance within our community. Uh, the New York variant, which is a variant actually of the B1351 variant, again, that's the technical name, looks like that may actually surpass the UK variant. And, and so it is a little bit of an uncertainty as to which one of those will be most common. But in the end, it actually doesn't really matter. Um, it matters a little bit, but it doesn't matter. What matters and what's important to understand about these variants is that they all cause the same illness. That illness is COVID-19. Now, what's different about the variants and the thing that I think is most important to understand is that the transmissibility of these variants, the ease with which you or I or someone else who may get infected can pass it to someone else changes. The disease itself doesn't. And so that's an important concept that the transmissibility increases. Remember I said in the beginning, the goal of the virus is to survive. To survive. How does it survive? It survives by going from person to person. So if it's more transmissible, it's a survival advantage. And that's what we're seeing mostly with these variants. Some of the variants cause more severe illness, and that's an important point. But the character of the illness is still the same. So you get a respiratory or a lung infection, causes coughing, shortness of breath, fever. You can get some intestinal complaints with diarrhea or nausea. That doesn't change with these variants. It's the ease with which it's transmitted and possibly the severity of the disease. So then how do we know that these variants differed from the original strain? Were there tests done? Could you explain that to our audience? Sure. The way we identify variants is by looking at the genetic makeup of the virus that's circulating in a community. And so throughout the epidemic, tools have evolved for us to understand the virus and identify the virus. And one of the most important tools is our ability to do genomic gene, genomic analysis of the virus, a 23andMe or an Ancestry.com, if you will, of the virus. And we can do that. We can actually map the virus and look at its genes. And when we see certain features, for example, what's called a cluster of viruses, that prompts the epidemiologist to test those specimens to look at it and say, gee, is this different than something else? And they can map it. So you do a 23andMe, if you will, on the virus. You look at its genetic makeup and you compare it. And you see, just like on the map, I had my 23andMe done. And so my genetic makeup comes from a very specific area in the Middle East. That's where uh, my heritage is from. You can do the same thing with these viruses. You can tell. Where did they come from? And so you can make an actual genomic map of the world. They've done that, actually. You can find that on the web. And you can see where these might have come from. We call that a lineage. What is the lineage of the virus? And so we're able to do that. We're actually able to map the gene of the viruses that are circulating and we can compare that to a lineage map across the globe and identify where these might have come from and where they exist. So that's how it's done. Okay, so I have a two-part question for you. So, you know, we hear about many of these variants that uh, there's uh, some that are very common and uh, pose more of a threat than others. So if you can explain which of those are, and since they are more transmissible than the original virus, do you think that we will see a new wave of COVID-19 cases this spring? So a couple of things in that regard. So we've talked a lot about the transmissibility. I think the main point that you're driving to is whether or not the vaccine 
is going to protect us. In other words, does our immune response to an older variant protect us for a newer variant? That's really the question that's inherent and worries a lot of us about this variant evolution. And what we know so far is that at least for the known variants that are being talked about, for the UK or the B117 variant, the vaccine and our immune response is highly protective. And so I don't have a lot of concern for that variant. It looks as though the variant from South Africa, the so-called B1351 variant, does have the ability to escape to some degree immune surveillance or our immune response. And that means that the vaccines may not be quite as effective. The good news though, is nonetheless, even though you may get infected, that vaccine and your own immune response will protect you from getting seriously ill. You won't die. You won't need a hospital. That's a big deal. As Mr. Kava pointed out earlier, and as we've experienced not only in the local hospital, the state and the country, this is a bad disease. The fact that your immune response to the vaccines or a prior infection will protect you is really important uh, for serious illness is really important. So, so I do think that those features that our immune response prevents serious illness um, is really important. Now, will that protect against a second wave? We don't know that yet. Um, we're hopeful. What, what we're pretty certain of, and I'm really comfortable with this, is that the vaccines and our immune response will prevent a serious, uh, serious illness second wave. I, I don't expect us to have that because right now, actually in New Jersey, I just looked this up just before I got on this webinar, we're at about 20% of the residents of New Jersey have actually gotten a dose of vaccine and about 10 to maybe 20% again, have actually had infection. So we've got a fairly sizable portion of the state's population that has had some immune response. So I'm hopeful that over the next couple of months with further vaccine deployment, we will blunt any, um, any uh, wave, if you will, of the variants. Hmm. So how are these variants detected? Are they detected by current tests? Could you maybe elaborate on that? Yeah, I mentioned we do genomic analysis. And so you do that. It is done by a special lab. It has to be requested. I saw an announcement just recently that actually Rutgers came out with a newer test that will allow us to do it more readily. It's not a commercially available test. So you have to get either the public health labs involved or some of the major universities are doing the genomic tests to actually identify the virus. It has to be requested specifically. It's not part of the routine that we do in, in the laboratory currently. Okay. So then are these current vaccines effective against, oh, let me just, before I ask that, how do these variants affect existing treatments? Because treatments have changed, correct? They have. The treatments have evolved. As I mentioned earlier, the, the disease state that occurs from the variants is the same as the disease state that occurred from the original or wild type virus. So our treatment modalities are are essentially the same. Uh, so we're using antivirals when appropriate. We're using immune-based therapies when appropriate. And there are a couple that we use for that. More recently, we did recognize that some of the monoclonal antibodies that uh, Mr. Kava had mentioned may not be as effective against some of the variants. So we've modified our approach with the monoclonals to identify those that are most effective for the variants. And, Frankly, um, the monoclonal we're using at Robert Wood Johnson Somerset is pretty effective for the variants that are circulating. So I'm pretty comfortable with that. So we don't really change our, we maybe make some tweaks, if you will, to the protocol, but we're not making any particular treatment changes because of the variants. Okay. So now my next question was, are the current vaccines effective against these variants? Right. And I alluded to that earlier, they are. Um, they may not totally prevent infection, but what they do is almost universally um, prevent serious disease. That's really important, um, particularly in our most vulnerable populations, people who are older and people with a lot of medical conditions, so diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, underlying cancer. If you get that vaccine, 
you will be protected for serious illness and death as a result of the wild strain, the one that was circulating earlier, and the variant strains. That's really important. I'm, I'm confident that that's been well shown and well documented um, across the world um, in the different trials that have been done. So it's really important that folks go out and get their vaccines, particularly as these variants increase in, in number. Now, I, would, I know we get a lot of questions about this, but how long does it take to develop immunity after getting the vaccine? Yeah, this was a surprise to me, but actually it's amazingly fast, first of all. So that's reassuring. So what we've learned, and we've seen this now with J&J, &J, you need one vaccine and you need four weeks and you, you've got pretty good immunity. The same thing applies even to the two-dose vaccines. The two-dose vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, although you need the second dose to boost the immune response, after the first dose and after that first four weeks is up, you've got a pretty robust immune response to the first dose. So it's re, it, it, it really is uh, reassuring that getting in the first dose is really amazingly protective. The second dose for the two dose vaccines adds a level of comfort, but getting the first dose in of almost en of any of the vaccines is really helpful from a protection point of view because it is really amazingly fast. Two to four weeks, you're, you're in pretty good shape. So get that first dose in. If you need a second dose, make sure you get it. Um, but uh, you know, thankfully it's pretty quick. You don't have to wait months. So then how long does immunity last? Do we know that yet? Yeah, we don't know that yet. This virus is, uh, we, we are at our one year mark. Um, I think, uh, you know, we gonna, we're gonna learn that. So even let's just say for, as an example to understand duration, we were to look at individuals who were infected when we first learned about the virus one year ago. We can now today measure their immunity for a year. That's it. That's the extent of the experience. We don't have a two year experience with this virus. So we have no way to know that it lasts longer than the year. We do know that immunity lasts at least a year in some cases. The question is, how many cases? Is it 50%? Is it 75%? Is it 90%? We don't know that percentage yet because we don't have enough experience. It's pretty remarkable to think, actually, frankly, that we even have a vaccine in less than a year. So understanding duration of immunity is really critical. And we're going to learn that over this next year. So that maybe next year, if we do this again, and we have a two-year uh, webinar to talk about immunity, we'll be able to say, is it two years or not? Um, so I'm pretty confident it's going to be a year, um, you know, for the strains that we're vaccinated about. And you may have some questions about whether we're going to need boosters and all, and we can address the question about that. Um, but, but I do think immunity is going to be at least a year. So why don't we address that question now? And I have a two-part question again. So, okay. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so are we going to need a booster? And then, well, actually, this is three-part. My, my apologies. So what is being done to determine how long the vaccine is effective? And so how is, like, is research being done? So A is, do we, are we going to need a booster? What is being done to determine how long that vaccine is effective? And um, is this being done by research? So to answer that question, you need to understand, you know, how do you go about trying to figure it out? So the research question is very relevant. So I may answer it in reverse order. So the way we're going to sort of inform us about that decision is we're going to watch what happens to all of us. I like to say we're all part of the largest human experiment that ever existed. And we're all participants. And, and as we get vaccinated, what we're going to study is we're going to study how often do the millions of people that are getting vaccine, do they get infected? And at what time point after the vaccine do they get infected? And if they get infected, what variant did they get infected with? And from that information, how often does infection occur after the vaccine? Um, what variant did they get infected with? After which vaccine did you get your infection? From all that information, it's going to inform us about whether or not it's necessary to get a, a booster. How often will we need a booster? 
for which vaccines might we need a booster at the moment. The best guess, because it is a guess at this point, because the research I just alluded to hasn't been done. We're just learning. Um, at the moment, the best guess is that it's likely we're going to probably get a booster, quote unquote, this fall, probably with the variant virus um, vaccine, if you will, um, to provide a boost for our immunity come this fall winter season on the chance that the vaccines won't be long enough lasting for those variants. But again, that's the plan, that's the tentative plan that may change as the next few months pass and we see what happens with this grand human experiment called COVID-19. So hopefully that answered the question, but we'll see. I'll, I'll bet you we get a booster this fall. That's sort of my leaning, but, but that may change as we learn more over the next few months. Okay, so that's anticipated that we're gonna need that just like the flu, but I'm gonna, right. I'm, I'm gonna throw a curveball now. So let's talk about a one-shot vaccination, right? A one-shot vaccine was recently developed and approved. Right. So can you explain what the difference between this and the other two shot doses are? Yeah, well, it, it, it kind of has to do with the experiment that was done to evaluate the vaccine. So Pfizer and Moderna designed a study to evaluate two doses of a vaccine simply based on historical precedent about how we do vaccines. So it's not unusual, frankly, for, for us all to get multiple doses. So for example, I got a shingles vaccine about a year or two ago. I needed two doses to get my shingles vaccine. That's how the study was designed. That's how they determined it. And so based on historical precedent, Pfizer and Moderna made the decision to do only a two-shot vaccine trial. That's how they got it approved for an EUA. J&J &J did it a little bit differently. They actually designed two studies. Study one was looking at one dose and study two, which is still ongoing, looked at two doses. So they actually tried to answer the question to some degree, do you need really two doses or might you get by with one? I thought that was actually pretty smart because from the perspective of the pandemic, getting the vaccine out quickly is most important. We're all seeing that now. And so if you can do the job with one, that's actually very useful. And so that's what they were trying to answer. So we know because of the study that they chose to do that one dose is very effective, 72% in the US, 66% overall, even with the variants, 100% um, for death. So even though it was 66% for infection, it was 100% for death from the disease. Um, that's very helpful. That's why it's one dose. We may find out when the second J&J &J study is completed, because it's not yet done, <clears throat> that two doses might actually boost that effect. And then we'll have to make a decision as a society, um, as a group of scientists, as a group of physicians, as a group of leaders, do we want to take a two-dose vaccine to gain more, or is it better to get deployed with one? So, so again, we're all part of this grand experiment. So it was really simply based on design of the study that J&J &J did that led to their approval for a one-dose shot. Had Moderna or Pfizer chosen to do two studies, one with two doses, one with one, they might have achieved the same conclusion. We just don't know that. And so, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just about to say, I was just about to ask you, like obviously with a one-shot vaccine, would you need a, a a booster, but you know, that we, may. Yet. we yeah, don't know don't the know. answer. We don't know that yet. Right. But, but then do we know if for the ones that had the two dose vaccine, we're saying most likely we're going to need a booster shot, right? So is that booster going to come? Is it going to be a separate shot as the flu shot? Is it going to be a combined flu COVID booster? Um, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, when I said you may need a second shot, that applies to the J and J or the other vaccines. So, the booster dose is is something that we're anticipating for all of those shots, and the reason that is is because of the variant question. So, the J and J shot, the original J and J vaccine, the one that's currently being deployed, the vaccine for Moderna and the vaccine for Pfizer, are all directed towards the wild type virus. They're not directed to the variant. And the reason it's being speculated that we may need a booster 
is because all three of those, and we can go further, the AstraZeneca shot that's in um, England, the Sputnik shot that's in Russia, all of them are directed to the wild virus and all of them may need a booster come this fall. So that applies to all of them. So now again, another question regarding the booster. So if we get a booster, does it have to be from the same manufacturer? Don't know the answer to that. I would, I would suggest probably not. I think the issue will be that you'll get a booster and it probably will be whichever vaccine um, is available to you. Okay. So, you know, again, um, many people are asking, is a one-shot vaccine safe? Um, were there any adverse um, events or allergic reactions that um, were um, known from the studies? And maybe can you share a little bit about the, the study? Sorry, I always have multiple multiple questions That's okay. for you. So I, I will tell you that all the vaccines are safe. Um, when you look at it globally, there have been I don't know, there must be, we must be up to 70 million doses at this particular point that have been distributed in the US, let, let, you know, and many more than that worldwide. And when you look at the safety profile of these vaccines, regardless of which one, they all are safe. The safety profile is on par with what we see with other vaccines. Um, the J&J &J vaccine, which is the one dose vaccine, again, has a very safe profile. There really is no particular, what we call signals, safety signals, as it relates to that vaccine that would raise any particular concern. So I think uh, the audience can feel very comfortable that whatever vaccine they have as an opportunity to receive, they should take. Um, the safety profile for all of them are really extraordinarily safe. And, and frankly, the safety profile of the vaccines are, are much safer than the risk of getting COVID. There's just no comparison. That's it's actually dwarfed by the severity of the COVID disease. Okay, so um, in in those studies, there were there were not just to be clear, there were no allergic reactions or anything or uh, any adverse effects. Well, no, there are adverse effects. So if you look at the 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 number of adverse effects, adverse effects occur with all vaccines. One of the lectures um, uh, in the lecture that I give, which I'm, one of the slides I'm fond of showing is the frequency of side effects, allergies, side effects from the shingles. I use the shingles vaccine because it's widely available. From the shingles vaccine is the same as the frequency of side effects from the COVID vaccine. So sure, about 10 to 15 to 30% of individuals may have some type of side effect. The most common is soreness in the arm. And that's true with almost every vaccine. When you get a tetanus shot, you get soreness in the arm. And if you look at the studies on the tetanus vaccine, for example, the soreness in the arm is somewhere in the range of 18 to 25%. And that's true with the COVID vaccine. So allergy reactions occur. The allergy reactions, right? Last time I looked was about one in 200,000. So that's the frequency of allergy effects. But sore arm, is a 20% number, but that's true with many vaccines. That's not out of proportion to what we see. So when we say that the side effect, there's no signals, we're, we're using as a signal, something that would worry us because it's more frequent than we would see with other vaccines. And it's at such a great frequency that, that it would say to us, we need to be careful. So serious health problems though, beyond beret death, um, serious allergic reactions that cause a risk to your life, that hasn't been seen at a level that raises a concern um, for us to say, be cautious about getting the vaccine. I would say be cautious about getting COVID, get your vaccine. The side effect profile is, is, is so good uh, that that should not be a concern. Okay, so yeah, thank you so much for explaining that. Um, so we have a, a lot of questions coming in, but I have a few more. <laughs> so should you get one more, uh, one version of the vaccine or mixed doses from different manufacturers? What are the risks of doing that? Do we know? Well, there's no physical risk. The risk of getting mixed vaccines is that the immune response um, may not be as robust as it otherwise would be if you got the same two doses in the two dose vaccines. So, uh, but otherwise there's not a risk, uh, you know, so it's not a physical risk. It's a risk that your response might not be as good. 
So you'd like to try and stick to the two. Now this may be, and, and this is gonna be studied, so we'll have more information, um, but, but right at the moment, just to maximize your benefit, get the same two doses. Okay, sounds good. So, um, so right now, at this time, I'm gonna open it up to questions from our audience. We'd like to have our audience post the questions in the Q&A section of this webinar, not in the chat feature. There is a lot of questions going on. Um, just, just to start with a few that have been posted. We know that it was previously stated that you should wait within 90 days after getting COVID to get the vaccine. Has that changed? And if so, why? Yeah, the, the CDC changed its guidance in that regard. Originally, it was suggested that you wait 90 days after. Um, more recently, the guidance changed and said that two weeks after you've recovered from COVID, it's okay to get your booster. I, I think the reason for that change was because it was creating some confusion about timing. It is still safe to wait the 90 days. And the reason it's safe to wait the 90 days is because in reinfection, getting infected again from COVID in those first 90 days after you've been infected is distinctly unusual, meaning that your immune system is protecting you for that period of time. So, so it, it's okay to wait. However, if you have the opportunity to get, your, to get a vaccine and to be boosted in your immune response, it's okay to take it 14 days after you have fully recovered. You need to be fully recovered. That's important. Not 80% recovered, not 90 fully recovered. You're back to normal. If you're not back to normal, you have up to 90 days. I think that's sort of the point to give you that flexibility of having time. One other thing, I actually like pointing this out. There was a study that was just published a couple of weeks ago that looked at individuals who had COVID and then got their vaccine. The, the, the authors of the study commented that they had a Terminator-like response. You couldn't, the COVID virus couldn't kill them um, because the immune response after you've had COVID and you got your vaccine was that good. So just by way of a personal story, my dad had COVID and uh, he's 88 and he got his vaccine. I'm now calling my dad the Terminator. So if, if, you've had your, if you've had COVID and you've survived and you're well, get your vaccine and you can walk around and say, I'm the Terminator. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna flip it a little bit. Let's say you got vaccinated, you were healthy, you didn't have COVID, you got vaccinated. So one of the questions that are being posed is, can you still test positive and spread COVID after getting vaccinated? Yeah, this is a million dollar question. You know, the issue about transmissibility after being vaccinated has been one of the bugaboos. Uh, I will tell you, there's a couple of things that are really reassuring that's, uh, that's accumulating in our knowledge base. The first is that it really does appear that the vaccines dramatically reduce transmissibility. And we've gained that information, again, from this grand experiment that we're all in, in which we're studying people who've been vaccinated and actually testing their nasal swabs after they've been vaccinated. And looking at their nasal swabs over time, weeks and months after the vaccine, to measure the amount of virus they either may have or that they may acquire. And it really, really does appear that probably at least 60, and maybe I saw a study this morning that said up to 80% reduction in the ability to acquire the virus and or transmit the virus after you're vaccinated. Man, that is reassuring because that has been a bugaboo. So I'm looking forward to seeing more information that will allow folks like those at the CDC to feel comfortable that the vaccine does really indeed prevent transmissibility and prevent you from getting enough virus in your nose or in your throat that could be transmitted from person to person. So I do think these vaccines are gonna definitely show transmissibility is dramatically reduced. Sounds good. So I'm trying to hit all the, the hot spots, so, uh, questions that are coming in that are very similar. So um, this next one is, what is your guidance on taking a pain reliever, such as Advil, um, Tylenol, um, post or um, pre or post the vaccination? 
great question, really common. Um, so first, don't take it preemptively. Remember I said that the side effect profile is on par with other vaccines. So I usually pose a question to people, you know, and some say yes, many say no. Do you take a Tylenol or a Advil, you know, when you go to get your flu shot before you get it preemptively? Most people say no and they say, I only take it, my arm gets sore or I feel a bit achy or, or I get a fever. And I think that's the right answer. Treat this vaccine as any other vaccine. I think that's the right way to go. Don't take it preemptively. No reason to take a medicine you don't need. You take it if you don't feel well, you know, 12 hours, 18 hours later. By that point in time, your body's immune response has already started. That's why your arm hurts. That's why you feel achy. So it's okay. Take a Tylenol, take an Advil. I, I took an Advil on my second dose. My arm hurt more and I felt more achy and I wasn't comfortable and I said, ah, the heck with it, I'm taking an Advil, I did. And I felt really fine and I took one dose and it was okay. I think that what happened and where this came from is someone did an experiment, they took an animal, they gave the animal really high doses of Advil and they were able to demonstrate that these, this animal model, you can blunt the immune response by giving really high doses of Advil. We're not talking about taking one or two Advils. We're talking about really high doses. That's not a fair experiment and, and the public shouldn't take away from news media accounts that that can blunt the immune response, that that applies to us if we take one Advil after we get a sore arm 12 or 18 hours later. That's perfectly fine. Okay, so we have a couple, this is a clarifying question. So for, for allergic reactions, is there one vaccine better than the others? I know you've said they're all good. They're all good, right? Um, but I know that's probably weighing on a lot of people's minds um, if they had an opportunity to decide. So this specific question is on allergic reactions. Well, so the question ends up being, can you measure the difference? So I'll give you the numbers. I, I would tell you, you can't. I think these are too small. But if you looked at the allergic reactions to Pfizer compared to Moderna, compared to J&J, &J, what you would find is that the allergic reaction to the Pfizer vaccine was about one in 200,000, to the Moderna vaccine about one in 400,000, and to the J&J &J vaccine maybe about one in four to 500,000. So does that mean that the allergic frequency to Pfizer is higher than it is for J&J &J and Moderna? Yes, but if you do the percentage calculation, you're talking about an allergy reaction that's a 0.001% versus 0.0005%. Those are tiny numbers. It's an impossible number to calculate. So statistically speaking, they're not different. On an absolute basis, they are but on a statistical basis, they're not different. So that's why I say they're equivalent because the, the, the frequency is so small, it's not really measurable. Okay, so I'm gonna combine a couple questions here. So should a fully vaccinated person wear their mask when in contact with another fully vaccinated person? And do you need to stay away from high risk family members after getting vaccinated? Timely question, this person read the news account of the CDC guidance today, I guess. <laughs> so so, the C, so I'll, I'll recount the CDC guidance today that came out, I think it was released yesterday. And what they stated was that in small groups, fully vaccinated individuals can be together without masks. That makes good sense. I just described to you the transmissibility issue. And certainly I will tell you personally within my family unit, my bubble, that's been our practice. Vaccinated individuals, gotta trust your family. Are they honest with you, All right? So do you trust your family members? But <laughs> fully vaccinated individuals, you're in a bubble, whatever, you don't need to be wearing masks. I think that's what the CDC has told us. You know, in, and they say in small groups that you're aware of that they're fully vaccinated. When you start getting larger groups, you're not sure. Or if you don't know, can you trust them? And so, you know, so, so out of an abundance of caution at the moment, we're still advising that larger groups, uncertain groups, uncertain vaccine status, you still wear a mask. I forgot your second question. 
Um, so uh, high risk family members. Yeah, high risk family members. So should you wear a mask with high risk family members? So, you know, what is stated is that low risk family members you don't need to, that are unvaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask. High risk family members that are vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. Again, small group because the vaccine works really well. Actually, one of the more reassuring features of all the studies was that the vaccine worked as well in vulnerable groups, people over 65, people with high risk medical conditions, as it did in less vulnerable individuals. So that is reassuring. So the answer to the question about high risk persons depends a little bit upon whether they're vaccinated. If they're vaccinated and you got a small group, you're in your bubble, it's okay. So when I'm with my dad, he's 88, going to be 89. He's the terminator. I don't need to wear a mask with my dad. Um, I did up until the point at which he both got sick and I got vaccinated because we weren't in the same bubble and I have kids. And so I was concerned about it, but I don't wear a mask with my dad at this point. And that would be the example that I would use. If my dad wasn't vaccinated, hadn't had COVID, so he's 88, he's in a vulnerable group, I would still be wearing a mask around my dad. Okay, so <laughs> along the lines of your Terminator father. <laughs> so we're, let's talk about reactions. Why do most people have no reactions on the first dose? What causes the reaction with the second dose? If somebody has a reaction to the first, first dose, is something wrong? So, and if they don't, um, to the second, did it work? I know there's a lot of questions in that, but you know. Right, so what's inherent in the question is that whether or not um, the absence of a response means you did not have an, an absence of a reaction, means you didn't have an immune response. And the answer is no. Um, it's just human nature. Some people have a more vigorous reaction than others. Part of the reaction is a local irritation phenomenon. So you get the vaccine into a muscle. When we give the shot, it's actually into a muscle. And, and the, the muscle doesn't like having things stuck in it. And it doesn't like having things injected into it. But that's what we're doing when we give you a vaccine. So it is a foreign substance that's injected into a muscle and that's what causes the soreness in your arm. The systemic things that you feel, fever, aching, headache, um, I had insomnia. Um, those are your body's reaction to the development of the immune response. So that's a good thing when it happens, we're happy about it. But the failure to have that doesn't mean you didn't have an immune response. And that was demonstrated overwhelmingly in all of the studies. So across the study platforms, Moderna, Pfizer, um, J and J, AstraZeneca, um, all the studies clearly demonstrated robust immune responses that were unrelated to the reactions you get towards the vaccine. So you can't take away from the story, I didn't have a response, I didn't get a reaction, I didn't have a good response, I'm still at risk. That is just not true. Um, it's, it's universal. The, the response to the vaccine is universal regardless of the severity of your reaction to the vaccine. If you had a bad reaction, you got in the wrong line when they were handing out the genes for reactions to vaccines, it has nothing to do with, this, with the, your response to it. So, so you can take a little bit of Tylenol and, and be reassured that it'll go, go away. It will go away after a couple of days. We're getting lots of great questions and here's another one I'd like to pose to you. So are vaccine antibodies as effective as natural infection antibodies, which are better and why? Is immunity different from vaccine? Yeah, one of the really cool things about these vaccines and all of the platforms are really remarkable science is that they really do mimic the natural infection. And so the antibodies that you, we call it raise, that you mount, that you get as a result of the vaccine mimic those that occur with natural infection. The term we use for that, there's a, there's a scientific term, it's called neutralizing antibodies. And we actually, if you look at the studies, they compared the level of neutralizing antibodies in, in natural infection to the level of neutralizing antibodies to vaccine-induced immunity. And they only ended up taking to um, clinical trial 
and to the vaccines that we get, those vaccines that induce neutralizing antibody to a level equal to or greater than the infection. So, so we know that the neutralizing antibody, the one that protects us, is equal to or greater with the vaccine as compared to natural infection. And as I've already stated, if you had the infection and you get one of these vaccines, you get a supernatural neutralizing antibody titer, tenfold higher than what you had from the natural infection. So it really boosts your ability to fight the virus um, taking a vaccine after natural infection. Uh, there's, no, there's no way to know yet whether the durability of that natural, uh, nat natural neutralizing antibody or the neutralizing antibody from the vaccine, the durability is gonna be longer or not. I'm suspicious that by taking boosters, as we talked about earlier, we're gonna be able to boost and get longer duration than we would have by natural infection because we don't expect natural infection to be lifelong. Uh, that wouldn't be expected because that's not true for, for other coronaviruses. So, so we do expect that the immunity at time will wane probably at two or three years. That's what most of us think, uh, but we're not absolutely certain about that. So, you know, we all want to get to herd immunity. Um, so, you know, maybe if you can kind of briefly recap on that, but this question is around herd immunity. If herd immunity occurs, 70% of the population has been immunized and, or has recovered from COVID, and 24% of the U.S. population is under the age of 18 and will not be vaccinated this year, what is a realistic time frame for the U.S. to reach herd immunity? Yeah, those are, that's a really good question and a very important observation. Since we're not vaccinating anybody under 16, um, we're dependent on natural infection in that group. Some people did get infected. So natural infection in that group is what's going to provide some level of immunity in that group. We're dependent on the public health measures in that group, which may be suspect because teenagers don't always listen and do what they were supposed to do. And, um, and we're expecting that we're going to get 70% of the population or 80% of the adult population to actually take the vaccine without a vaccine mandate. So the person that the questioner is, is spot on that we need to um, do a lot of education. Sorry. No, it's okay. that, we need, that we as I was, I was going out of the screen um, that we need to do a lot of education um, as it relates to encouraging people to get the vaccine. So we've got a lot of work to do. And, uh, you know, that's why these kinds of efforts, and I appreciate you making an effort to outreach, that we really encourage people to participate in. We're all, we're all participants in this grand experiment. So I have no prediction on when we're going to reach herd immunity. Do I think that we're going to get herd immunity in June or July? No, we're not. Um, but do I think that we're going to get enough immunity and that we'll have enough people participating in the things that are important from the perspective of public health that we're gonna have um, enough resistance within the community to prevent serious illness, serious death, and overwhelming our health system. And I think that's really what we're all talking about. And so I think we're gonna to get to a very high level. We're not gonna to get to the 80% or 85%, if you believe that's the number, um, simply because of the math. The math doesn't work and the questioner asked the right question in that regard. We're going to get close. We're not going to get to that 85% number. Can't. A portion so, of the population can't get vaccinated. So I think this individual also has a follow-up question along those lines. So if, if, if let's say we get to 75%, we vaccinate 75%, that means there's 25% who aren't. And are they at uh, risk of getting COVID? Yes, they are. So the concept of herd immunity is to prevent pandemic or epidemic. It's not to prevent all disease. And so what you expect is that there will be intermittent, intermittent cases, but there won't be sustained outbreaks. So you may have a cluster, and, and we see that, you know, use the example of measles back two or three years ago, where there were outbreaks in California. A lot of us think that we might be at herd immunity for measles, 
But intermittently, we hear about outbreaks with measles. There was an outbreak of mumps somewhere in, I think, Ohio. Um, and the reason that happens is that although the very ma the vast majority of the population is vaccinated, these highly transmissible diseases still find little clusters where they can create havoc, but it doesn't create a big, sustained, overwhelming outbreak that, that really brings us to our knees almost with regard to health system operations or the economy. And that's what we're looking to try and avoid. So we've got to get to a high enough number to avoid that. And, th and that's what we're really looking to. The herd immunity is that theoretical threshold number. Um, the closer we get, the better. Um, but most of us believe that this disease is going to ultimately be what's called endemic. Small, ongoing, low levels of infection with this that don't cause and don't wreak havoc within our society and within our system. OK. So um, here's another couple, two series of questions. If, if you got the vaccine, do you still need to quarantine after being exposed to somebody who was COVID positive? Are quarantine requirements still in place? Um, do these apply to vaccinated individuals? So if maybe you can kind of speak to that. Right, that guy, it's actually that, you know, there was a lot of hoopla in the news about the CDC's guidance uh, yesterday. But that CDC actually gave its first guidance on vaccinated people two or three weeks ago when they changed that guidance. And at that point in time, what they said, and I agree, is that um, if you're vaccinated and you're exposed and you have no symptoms, that's a really important and, you do not need to quarantine. Still need to wear a mask, but you do not need to quarantine. So the quarantine requirement on exposure for vaccinated individuals changed about three weeks ago. You do not need to quarantine upon exposure. Again, assuming you have no symptoms. You get symptoms, you need to quarantine, you need to be tested. Okay, sounds good. So, um, okay, so um, this question is, what causes a certain variant to be prevalent? Is it environmental? Well, it, it's the biologic explanation I gave earlier. It's all about survival of the fittest. And so the variants that survive are the variants that are fit, meaning they're able to cause infection in humans. They're able to sustain themselves, meaning that they can't, they, they don't succumb uh, to the immune system. They don't kill too many people, believe it or not, as morbid as that sounds. If a virus is too aggressive and kills its host, it can't survive. So, so the concept of variant survival or evolution of viruses is the concept of them being able to sustain themselves and survive. So that's the goal. So don't kill too many people. Allow yourself to be transmitted. I'm personalizing the virus. But, but allow the virus to be transmitted from person to person and allow it to you know, make you a little bit sick, but maybe not too sick, because then you'll transmit it to somebody else. OK. Let's see, we'll, we'll take a few more questions. So has there been any data on vaccination effectiveness with di the diabetic population? Yeah, a fair amount. This, but all the manufacturers, all the studies went to great extent to include vulnerable, as I said earlier, vulnerable populations, those who are older, as well as those who had comorbid medical conditions, diabetes, heart disease, uh, lung disease, underlying cancer uh, were included um, assuming they weren't undergoing chemotherapy, for example, um, because they wanted to make the effort to demonstrate that the vaccine was effective in those groups of individuals. And in diabetics, people with high blood pressure, people with coronary disease, heart disease, it worked as well as it did in those who did not have those conditions. So yes, diabetics were included. Okay. So another um, series of questions that have been coming in are around um, Neurological side effects. So have there been any neurological side effects from the vaccine? Has anyone died after receiving the vaccine? So the neurologic side effects comes up because there have been reports, and Google will tell you this, about Bell's palsy in particular occurring after um, vaccine. Bell's palsy is a neurologic condition where you lose function on the side of your face. Um, that has been seen in some people who've gotten the vaccine. The problem with it is that the frequency of that event is no greater than the expected frequency in the general population. 
So coming to a conclusion that the vaccine increases the likelihood of that event is very difficult. Likewise with Guillain-Barre, which is the other neurologic condition that people ask me about a lot, we have not seen an increased incidence of Guillain-Barre in the millions of individuals who've been vaccinated with this vac vaccine. So the answer, I guess, generally is neurologic conditions haven't been seen out of proportion to what might be expected in the general population. In regard to death after the vaccine, there have been cases of people who've succumbed after getting the vaccine. But again, the question ends up being is whether or not that's related to underlying health. For example, there's been a great push in this country and in New Jersey in particular to vaccinate the nursing home population. And many of the nursing homes were highly successful with vaccine rates well over 90% in a group at very advanced age and frequently in a group that were either um, you know, at end of life care or end of life time. And so it's hard sometimes to understand, okay, well, you know, how much um, of what we're witnessing in that population is really related to vaccine or not. So how do you do that? How do you figure it out? Well, you compare the death rates in those highly vulnerable people to what would be expected historically, to what you're seeing prospectively after the vaccine. And you look to see if the rates of death are different in, that, in those two cohorts. And we've not seen that. So although it would be wrong to say death hasn't been seen, that's not true. We've seen people who've died. It does not appear to see, be that the rates of death are higher than what otherwise would have been expected in historical groups. That's a really important concept. This came to light. Uh, you may recall, Serena, back in the beginning when we were starting to vaccinate in, uh, I don't know whether it was Norway or Denmark or Sweden, but one of the countries in, in the northern part of Europe had a whole bunch of deaths in a nursing home population after the vaccine. And that raised some concern. And that was investigated and what I described is what was determined. Okay. Um, thank you. So um, this, this next set of questions, either you or Tony could probably answer. So what vaccine is RWJ administering? And is, um, is it the same at every RWJ location? Should we toss that one to Tony? Sure. We'll let Mr. Kava take that one. Thank you, Dr. Nehas. Uh, so all of the RWJ sites, the hospital sites that have uh, uh, open pods or points of distribution are all at this point uh, using Pfizer. Uh, that's the vaccine that's been made available to our hospital simply because we, all of our hospitals have the ultra cold freezers, although it's been shown that Pfizer doesn't need to be in the ultra cold freezers, but that's why we're getting uh, Pfizer. A few of our hospitals in the emergency departments have been allocated Johnson & Johnson uh, based on a, a trial that the, the state is looking at in using the one dose Johnson & Johnson to vaccinate uh, individuals coming to the ED for other reasons who have not been vaccinated. But for now, it's Pfizer. Uh, and the same thing is that the, uh, our Edison uh, mega site is right now the uh, Pfizer product. Okay, thank you. And Tony, I know we've done a lot in the hospital to keep everybody safe with COVID. If you can maybe share a little bit of what we've done and why it's important not to delay in seeking care um, during this time, um, I think that might be helpful to the audience as well. Sure. I mean, since the very beginning, we, we've instituted a lot of safety measures. I mean, we, we've uh, obviously have been requiring masking of all of our staff, all of our uh, visitors, all of our patients, even those that are, that are in a bed. We've, we've done uh, testing of patients prior to them coming in for surgical procedures. Our behavioral health patients and maternity patients are all tested. You know, we do the, the requisite screenings that you pretty much see everyone doing and, and all that's continuing, as well as the, the daily cleanings that we do uh, in and around the hospital. So, you know, the hospital, like anything else, um, you can you can get an infection here. It's a, it's a lot. It's less likely, but the disease in the second phase, and Dr. Nehouse knows this a lot better than I do, is so widespread. Part of it of the spread is maybe due to pandemic fatigue and and just letting our guard down in terms of of not distancing or wearing masks. But you know it, we we did not close our services in the second wave like we did in the first wave, and uh, you know I think. We had to do that because what we did see in the first wave were, were a lot of individuals delaying care, uh, whether it's for a heart attack or stroke or, or some other, uh, you know, severe disease entity. And we're seeing that still in our emergency department, even though the numbers are down, 
patients coming into our emergency department are, are much sicker than they were pre-COVID. And that's because a lot of individuals, because of the fear, have delayed uh, you know, seeking care. So my advice would be, whether it's to your physician or an urgent care center or the emergency department, don't delay your care. Uh, it, it's a lot more deadly if you're delaying your care than, than the uh, fear or, or the risk of getting COVID. Okay, thank you. So last question, I'll throw it out there. What is the best way to prevent from getting COVID? Is that vaccine and the four W's? Who wants to take that one? Get your shot. And you know, public health measures are really important. I mean, that, without question, it's the vaccine. Um, I think the vaccine is really critical. I know it's been difficult with regard to the um, accessibility of it. Um, we're seeing that change. I think the U.S. is now over 2 million shots on a daily basis. Um, New Jersey has actually picked up. We've now got over 20% of the residents having gotten at least one dose of the vaccine. So availability should have improved and is continuing to improve. Get the vaccine. But in the meantime, don't forget the four W's. So wear your mask, watch your space, wash your hands. And when you're sick, stay home. Keep me, keep everybody else safe. So we all have a role. Well, thank you so much. I know we're past our hour and um, I uh, apologize, but there were so many great questions and I know we didn't get to everyone's questions, but um, certainly Dr. Nahas, thank you so much, um, Tony as well for, um, presenting to us um, today. Um, so again, Dr. Nahas, as we conclude today's webinar, what are some of the key points about COVID-19 that you would like to leave our audience with? Any last One, words? Yeah, sure, Serena. Thank you again for your, all your efforts. I think getting information out to the community is really critical. And I'm, you know, I'm always happy to participate and uh, just uh, appreciate all your efforts in doing that. Um, I think the key things and the key takeaways that I would put out there for everybody is that one, these vaccines are highly effective, more effective than we would have anticipated or expected. And we are so fortunate, um, frankly, that uh, they became available as quickly as possible. And, and the reason they became, and we didn't touch on this, the reason they became available as quickly as possible was because we were primed for this. This is not new. Although it's new technology, it's not really. The technology for these vaccines existed for a decade and there was great experience in using them. So, uh, you know, it, it's just a testament to the, to, to, to the industry. It's a testament to the volunteers that participated. We should all feel relieved that we got these vaccines as quickly as we did and we should be comforted by their safety. They work well, they're safe, and uh, we should all be thankful for that. The second thing I would point out is that the difficulties with getting the vaccine are gonna very quickly go away over the next month. The, the, the numbers of shots that will be available will make it very easy for everybody to get a vaccine. Please get in line, get a vaccine. And, and lastly, you know, until you do, um, just be aware that this virus is still around. Um, and looking at the numbers the last week, we are still at the numbers of cases in the state of New Jersey that we had in the middle of November. That's a lot of community prevalence. Be smart. If you're out and about and you're not vaccinated, wear a mask, watch your space, wash your hands. And if you're sick, do not be out and about. And if we do that, we'll all get through this and we'll have a great summer. So with that, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Nahas. Thank you again. Thank you, Tony. So this will conclude today's webinar. Please remember that the opinions expressed here by our medical experts is not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. If you need a physician, please call our physician referral line at 1-888-724-7123. And for more information about COVID-19, please visit our website at www.rwjbh.org backslash Somerset. On behalf of RWJ Somerset, thank you all for joining us this afternoon and be safe. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.